sister refuge in Bodhichit. Yeah, Bodhichit. yeah. Sheila yeah, is I, your love is your lovely Zoom host. <laughs> Hi, Sheila. Welcome, Venerable. Thank you. Welcome everyone else to Shanti Diva. We're very glad to have you here. So um, just before we start, I want to remind everyone to um, keep themselves muted. And we would you like questions at the end of your talk? If people uh, have a way? question, if you could put up your hand and I'll, uh, I'll try to accommodate you because there's, sometimes there's something um, urgent that you want to clear up at the moment. And uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. And I will, but I'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself if you want. Sounds good. Okay. So um, can I give you a little introduction before we start? For those of you who aren't familiar with Venerable George, he's an American born Buddhist monk. And after graduating from MIT with a physics degree and after various teaching jobs, he found himself at Copan where he was very fortunate to be able to study with Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And after that, he became more an, an ordained monk. And for those of you that uh, were at the uh, Lama Osul's teaching, Venerable also was um, Osul's English curriculum teacher while he was studying. So Venerable George teaches both meditation, Buddhist philosophy worldwide. He's been a program director and teacher at various FTM centers. And so with a training in science and Buddhist thought, we're really looking forward to his guiding us tonight and with this series on how we can apply these practices in our everyday life. So. Thank you. Ready whenever you're ready. And I can put up prayers. You want to start with a refuge prayer? Let's, let's. What, what would be best? Do you know the, the verse Sange Chudang Soki Chognam La? Maybe you have it in English. Is that one that you usually recite? I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, yes. and the highest assembly until I'm enlightened. Uh, Yeah. Okay. There we Everybody go. Everybody see that? So let's recite. Let's recite it once in Tibetan, and then we'll say it two more times in English. Sangye Churang Soki Chognam La Changchu Bardu Dagni Kapsu Chi Dagi Jinsa Od Dagi Chunyen Gipe Sonam Ki. Drula Penju Sange Drupa Shul. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the highest assembly, Supreme Assembly. By the merits, created through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. We'll, we'll, do, a little, we'll do a little meditation also uh, to begin with, but let me give a little bit of introduction. Um, this particular uh, class that we're having, we're talking about a text uh, that you may or may not recite uh, every month called the Guru Puja. In Tibetan, it's called Lama Chopa. And um, I don't know, some of you, 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 have, you probably have it in English. Uh, I did a long retreat a couple of years ago. And uh, during that retreat, uh, one of the main sections was to uh, besides, you know, another session where there's some other kinds of meditations uh, was to do the Lama Chopa, the Guru Puja. And uh, I found one of the most uh, satisfying uh, parts of the whole retreat was this glance meditation on the Lan Rim, on the stages of the path. So generally, we could say that all meditations uh, fall under two categories, two umbrellas, the Dalai Lama says, you know, you could say all, they're either stabilizing meditations when you're trying to hold one thing and not uh, analyze and discursive meditations, analytical meditations, another kind. We could say that the supreme kind of um, stabilizing meditation is tranquil abiding, shine, uh, shamatha. 
it's all different language, right? Tranquil abiding in English, calm abiding. The supreme kind of analytical meditation is a penetrative insight. Uh, Tibetan says lakton. Uh, we, we, we probably know the word vipassana. So uh, from when we talk about uh, doing the, uh, uh, paying homage to the guru, offering to the guru, which is Lama Chopa, Guru Puja. Puja means basically to please, right? Um, so the, the puja, pujas generally include various elements to please the mind of the guru, the omniscient Buddha. Uh, one of the elements that's paramount is uh, the seven limb offering, which the puja has, offering of prostrations, uh, a verse of you know, making prostrations, paying homage in other words, uh, making offerings, uh, confessing one's negativities, rejoicing in the virtues of oneself and others, uh, requesting the Buddha to turn the wheel of Dharma, uh, requesting the Buddha and the, and the aspect of the guru to remain, you know, not to disappear and to dedicate one's merit. So there's seven, seven limbs. Uh, in the Lama Chopa, there, it begins by making, having a visualization, the Guru Puja, like behind me, uh, can you see? <laughs> uh, this is called the, uh, the, the, the Sokshing. Sok means uh, accumulation. Um, and shing means uh, field, the, the field of assem the field of of accomplish or of assem of uh, collecting accumulating virtuous karma. So one has the uh, the image the, in in the I don't know if you can see where my finger is there. Lama Sumkapa is kind of at the top of a tree, and one begins the visualization by. Um, First of all, arising as a deity, oneself, if one has some tantric initiations, and then visualizing, uh, bless, offering, um, blessing of the offerings and so forth, and uh, visualizing the, the tree of assembled gurus, lineage gurus, and then uh, making various kinds of offerings. So, there are the seven limbs or elaborate five verses on offering prostrations to various aspects of the guru. And then uh, physical offerings, outer offerings like flowers and, and so forth and lamps. Um, inner uh, um, offering of uh, goddesses that, of the, that are holding uh, in particular objects of the five senses and uh, an offering of the of inner substances, the transformation of, of things that are conjoined with consciousness, we call inner offering, offering of um, various other kinds of things, mandala offering and so forth. And then there are various requests uh, and supplications to the guru. Finally, after, after receiving the blessings of what are called the four initiations, uh, near the end of the puja, one encounters this panoramic or glance meditation on the stages of the path. Uh, there are various kinds. You, you may know the foundation of good qualities. Have any of you heard of that? I'm not sure what, you know, some, some have. Uh, that is a glance meditation um, on, the, on the stages. There, there are several others. This particular one, was composed by the, the, the a Lama called uh, the first Panchen Lama, sometimes called the fourth Panchen Lama because although he was the first one to receive the name Panchen Lama, uh, subsequently it was, it was determined that he was the reincarnation of three previous uh, of his in, you know, incarnations. And so then he became co called the fourth Panchen Lama. So sometimes there's a confusion uh, about that because in some of his, like he wrote a commentary on the Mahamudra 
um, root verses and commentary. And one of them he's called the first Panchen Lama and another he's called the fourth Panchen Lama, but it's the same one. It was just uh, when it was recognized as, as uh, being the reincarnation of some earlier Lamas. So what we do at that point is we, we still imagine the, the uh, field assembled gurus to whom we have made offerings one's root guru in the, in the center and so forth. And uh, one has a separate verse for many of the stages of the, uh, the path, the Lam Rim, uh, which is, I'm sure, well, I'm ab not absolutely sure, but probably pretty sure that many of you know what the Lam Rim is. Does anyone not know what the Lam Rim is? Shake your hand the stages of the path. So it, that kind of a literature in Tibetan Buddhism became very popular after uh, the great Indian guru Atisha came to Tibet, wrote a very short text called the Lamp of the Path to Enlightenment, Bodhiprata Bhaddipam. Um, and uh, that text kind of had condensed all of the stages essential meditations of the path. And uh, as a result of that, Lama Tsongkhapa wrote his Lanrim Chemo, the great stages of the path, and a middling version of that and shorter versions and other Lamas, Dalai Lamas wrote other Lanrims like Essence of Refined Gold and um, the, the Blissful Path and the Quick Path by various Lamas. This particular uh, text by the Pension Lama, I think is very blessed and I feel very close to it because I had a chance to meet uh, the um, previous Pension Lama, not the Pension Lama who's young, still a young man, but his previous incarnation in Tibet. Uh, I think Paul was there at the time, weren't you there? When, when Jeffrey Hopkins and Elizabeth Knapper uh, we were all in Tibet at the same time. Maybe, maybe you weren't, weren't uh, there. Anyway, we went to before my time. Yeah, we went to Shigetse. Uh, I went with Lama Sopa Rinpoche, and at one point they went off to some place, and I, I ended up going to uh, the Pempo, where um, Atisha's famous monastery was, uh, Reading, where the the great Kadampa Lamas lived. And then I went to Shigase just on the off chance and it turned out that, that the Pension Lama was teaching for the first time, actually giving an, an initiation there, uh, a, a blessing of the long life Amitayus. And there were tens of thousands of Tibetans who had come. And I had a chance somehow just by fate to be on the stage when there were like maybe 20 or 50 people and had a chance to meet him and actually uh, saw him afterwards and asked some questions and helped a little bit with the organization he was doing. So I had, I felt I had some karmic connection with the Pension Lama. You know, the Pension Lamas are considered, the, the Dalai Lamas and the Pension Lamas in Tibet are considered to have sort of a, a, an equal kind of status. They often recognize one another over the years, the reincarnations. And um, this glance meditation at the end and encompasses all of the main thoughts of the stages of the path. So what one would do is after having uh, performed the main kind of puja, accumulated merit and eliminated negative karma, in other words, and made requests to the, to the Lama, one meditates on each of these verses to recall the stages of the path. Now in giving a, some talks about these, I'm going to rely on a, on a text, a Tibetan text uh, written by uh, Ngutu Dharma Bhadra. I don't know, it, probably none of you would know necessarily who that was. One of the great uh, Galukpa Lamas uh, several generations ago, but not that so far along, uh, long ago. Um, and uh, one of the lineage lamas in various uh, in the various uh, tantric practices and everything. So 
uh, I'm going to really rely on his commentary. There are other there are other Lanrim texts. If you kind of want to get a good refresher refresher of the uh, stages of the path, you can refer to uh, Pabonka Rinpoche's um, liberation in the palm of your hand, in the liberation in our hands. Uh, or, you know, this is the the one that. Uh, uh, Geshe Tarchin uh, organization helped to print up. There's also an FPMT translation of that. Uh, the Lanrim Chemo, which I don't have right here, various versions. Geshe Zopa's commentaries on the Lanrim Chemo. Uh, another commentary on this, but particularly on these verses, one can find in uh, this text that was uh, translated by David Gonzalez, very fine man who became a monk near the end of his life and uh, did a lot of translations. And this is a text by uh, Kanchen Yeshe Geltsen, which is his, his commentary on Lama Chopa. And so within that, there's a commentary when you get to the section on that glance meditation, uh, there's a commentary to that. So if you are interested in uh, pursuing some of these other kinds of things. I'll also make mention sometime of the, the Lan Rim written by Lama Tsongkhapa himself called the three principles of the path. Sometimes they say as principle aspects, but uh, you could leave out the word aspects if you want. The three principles of the path. Uh, and you'll see why in, as we go through the discourse so before we begin, let's do a, just a very short uh, stabilizing meditation to, to calm the mind. Uh, we've said a verse of refuge and bodhicitta to begin with, and I'll talk about that verse again later and other times. So sit comfortably with your spine erect, your, your eyes not fully open, not fully closed. Relax your body and relax your mind. Place your attention on the incoming and outgoing breathing without controlling it. Mindfulness of the breathing. Recognize when you're breathing in. Recognize when it changes and when you're breathing out. And don't multitask. Don't be thinking of other things. Simply let that be your sole object of observation. Let go of your attention to the eyes, what your eyes may be seeing, even though they're partially open, you, what you're hearing, smelling, tasting, or feeling in your body. If you get a little bit of stability, a little bit calm mind, now place your attention on your mental consciousness, sort of like the mind one part of the mind, a corner of your mental consciousness, watching the thoughts within your mind, conversations, memories of the past, plans of the future, 
judgments about the present. And try to see within the days, those various thoughts, cloud-like thoughts, within the spaciousness of your mind. Don't follow the thoughts that come. Don't give them sustaining energy by focusing on them or thinking about them. Let them go, just note them and let them go. And try to see the spaciousness of the mind within which they are arising. Even when the thoughts are present, if your mind is overcome by discursiveness, all of those thoughts are emerging from a certain quality of the mind called its conventional clear light nature. It's not something you, you see with the eyes. It's not something that has a color like ordinary light. It's known by, you could say the eye of wisdom, the wisdom eye, your wisdom, and by the eye of gnosis, or you say yeshe. It's within this spaciousness of the mind that we develop good qualities that are you know, qualities that are not yet there or in, increase, improve the qualities that are already budding up. Because the faults of the mind are not the very nature of the mind, the afflictions, the klesha or Tibetan we say nyonmo, they're not the very nature of the mind. They can be removed. There are adventitious, they're, they're due to causes and conditions and can eventually be removed through, ceased through the application of wisdom. Just thinking of this as a great resource that we have recognized at the moment that we have obtain this life of leisure and endowment, we call perfect human rebirth, turning our minds to the Dharma. Think that during this next uh, period of time, before we end tonight, I'm going to listen to the talk, contemplate it, use my wisdom. If I have questions, try to clear them up, and to meditate on the, some concepts that may become clear to us, that is to hold the mind single-pointedly on them, to try to develop deeper and deeper wisdom about them for the purpose of becoming a real hero, uh, a bodhisattva, a, eventually a Buddha, for the sake of others, not just so that one no longer has problems, but so that one can be a resource for all other living beings. I'm going to listen, participate in the class tonight in order to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. one way of focusing the mind like that. So, I think that's it. Bring your attention back to the present. These classes are uh, about an hour and a half. I'm, I'd be happy to stay afterwards if people have questions that they want to 
engage in in a more uh, you know in depth way. But uh, so we don't have an awful lot of time. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about this uh, this text. So we're using uh, a translation that the FPM T uses. And Sheila, could you put up the, the, the first verse? Do you have it as a document or, or is that something that people have downloaded to them? Yeah, we go. Glance meditation section of Lama Tropa. There we go. So yeah, perfect. So um, I'll just read this first of all. Uh, the Tibetan is Shingchok Dampa Chesun Lama La. Chuching gupe so a tape tu, deleg sawa gombo kyoniki geshin jesu simba jingilo. Supreme field of merit. Uh, this is the FPMT translation. My perfect pure guru. Through the power of having made offerings and respectful requests. Uh, to you, my perfect guru, I seek your blessings, uh, savior, and the very root of happiness and goodness that I may come under your joyful guidance. Okay, so that's the first verse that we're going to be talking about. So when you, when you, um, you don't have to leave it up. Maybe, maybe people, uh, if you're interested, you, if you, you can download the PDF, uh, print it out if you want, or if you already have the, the Lama Chopa as a text in English, you can just have that. You can refer to that. So in uh, the commentary that I'm using, as I said, was was composed by um, Muchu Dharma Bhadra. Muchu means uh, liquid liquid silver li literally but it, what it means is mercury you know it's kind of mutu um dharma badra means excellent dharma so he was a great lama and uh so he he's he has this when we get to the the glance meditation he says this is the second sort of second section of the explanation. So the first section was all of these offerings and supplications and visualization of the merit field and everything. So he says, this section is uh, has four parts. This section is uh, requesting blessings of experience and realization of the stages of the path. Lamgi Rimpe Nyamtoki Jinlab Shualashi. So there are four sections. So this, the, the general outline that you find of the Lan Rim in, Lama, so in the FPMT uh, is maybe based on the Lan Rim Chemo. Uh, Pabonka Rinpoche's uh, outline is slightly different in some places. This breaks it up just slightly different, saying requesting blessings of Nyam Tok. Nyam means experience kind of like, uh, well, maybe temporal experience that you have some kind of insight into something. What do the Zen people talk about? Satori? I, I asked one great Tibetan Sakya Lama once what Satori meant. Have you, any of you know, what, have any of you heard the term Satori? No one has, okay. Oh, Mar Marianne has, okay. I'm sure, uh, uh, some of the, the rest of you have heard also. So, uh, Satori, some, sometimes there would be some insight that one would have instantaneously. Um, generally in Tibetan Buddhism, if you, you, you can sit, talk about instant, instantaneous realizations, but they generally are due to it, uh, imprints that are put in your mind in previous lifetimes. But you can have some experience of the path, some kind of experiences, some development of uh, love and wisdom and so forth that are uh, due to your analysis and collection of merit, you know, and then you can have insights that are due to applying wisdom and logic 
that can bring about a culmination of those uh, experiences, the sort of temporal experiences that can bring about something more long lasting. So requesting blessings of experience and uh, realization of the stages of the path has four parts. So it's um, the first one is the, the way to rely on the spiritual guide, the, the, uh, the Shenyan, the, the uh, friend, spiritual friend, uh, which is the root of the path. Sometimes people say the guru is the root of the path. I think the, the, the method of relying on, on the guru, you know, attending to the guru, guru devotion, that itself is the root of the path. And, okay, but anyway, that's my my reading of that. Um, so that, that's that's the first outline. Then having relied, how to train the mind. Lo jita jongsu. So uh, that's that's um, more or less the same as as the general lanrim. Generally in the Lan Rim outlines, the second outline is uh, exhorting oneself, uh, ex exhorting, you know, you know uh, sort of giving impetus or you know, urging people to take advantage of this life of leisure and endowment. But that, that particular, the, the, uh, the, the verse, uh, the meditations on perfect human rebirth here are mixed with the meditations on impermanence and death. In accordance with uh, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, one of his other Lan Rims, the three principal aspects of the path. There, he was instructed by Manjushri to write that text, and he integrated those two together. So we'll 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 talk about that in more detail. So um, first, how to rely on the spiritual friend, which is the root of the path, the reliance, uh, having relied on that how to train the mind, and then, uh, although the mind is trained, if one has not finished all the points of the path, the way to uh, transfer consciousness at the time of death, that comes way near the end of the text. Most of the text is this, how to train the mind, having relied, and then, uh, Prayers at the end, um, which are sort of condensation of the of the meanings. Okay, so the first one. So how to rely on uh, the spiritual friend, which is the root of the path. So the verse is as as we just read. Shinshuk dampa jisun lama la chuchin gupe so watabe tu delek sawa gompi goniki. So um, he, his commentary is sort of like a word commentary. So he's giving an idea of this. And I, I find it very, very useful. When you, when you do this glance meditation, you might, you might find uh, that the only time you do it is twice a month if you do the Guru Puja, when you offer soak. Um, you know, Gana Chakra, Gana. Um, or you may find that it's useful to recite every day as a remembrance to bring to mind all of the stages of the path. I might have mentioned when I when I taught for your center a few weeks ago uh, the 37 practices of the Bodhisattvas, the, the, the Buddha's offspring. Uh, that uh, one of my great teachers, Geshe Repton, uh, who was a, 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 a senshap, which means sort of like debating partner or a companion of the Dalai Lama. Um, Geshe Repton was a, was a very, very uh, educated and practiced uh, person. So Nyantok, he had both realization and experience. And uh, he, used, he, he said once that his only regret in having 
uh, his main regret in having met the Dharma was that there were some days in his life when he didn't meditate on the stages of the path. Why is that? Because the stages of the path are kind of like, uh, like a nectar when the mind is you know, chaotic and you're worried about things, you can't figure something out, puts everything into perspective. It's kind of like pouring cool water into uh, on, on, the, on, on your fevered head, you know, cooling off some relief. And uh, so, um, Shink Shok Damba. So he says, uh, that this this one verse in the first line, Sikdangpo, Sokshing Seltap, it's reminding yourself to visualize the uh, the Sokshing, the the field of of collection of merit, like in like behind me. So Shinkshok Dampa. Uh, So, so visualizing the merit field, Chuching Soa Tape. Well, I, and I and I don't have the the Engl your, your English version. Maybe maybe you can put that up again for a second. Can you? Is it possible to put it in a in a smaller section so people can still see faces of other people, Sheila? I can't hear you because you're you're muted. I, I can't tell what Sheila's thinking there. Okay, I'm Trying sorry. To... Um, I I don't know how to put it on the side. I can only. Oh, okay. Uh... Yeah, but just put it put it up again for a second. So uh, I'll. I'll mention a little bit. Can I suggest one thing is that she sent the link on the chat box so people can open the link and open the text on their computer and keep the Zoom window open. Thank you, Georges. <laughs> is it French, Georges? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good idea. Thank you for that. So, um, so, Shingshok Dampa Jason Lama La. The first says to the uh, the, the uh, holy and venerable uh, to the Lama. Jason Lama means uh, the the uh, here it says perfect pure guru. I think they're they're uh, trying to take Dampa as meaning uh, an epithet of of uh, the guru. But dampa, uh, pure here, it re refers, is not so much pure, according to this commentary, as um, supreme, like we say, don, uh, uh, don dam demba. Dampa means highest. So the highest supreme field uh, of merit. So what that means is uh, the, the guru, and you know, encompassed as sort of the epitome of this field of accumulating merit is, uh, is a supreme field because unlike ordinary worldly fields where you can plant a seed and uh, you have to plant it at the right season, you know, and you, you know, it, it, it has certain times when it develops in the spring and then the, it ripens later and then you get the fruit maybe in the fall or something. And there are periods when you can't uh, plant seeds in the worldly fields, unless you have a greenhouse like I have. Uh, unlike that, the making requests and attending to the spiritual guide that spiritual guide and the, the, the merit field here is like a supreme field, is like a, a yeah, special field because you can plant seeds in it anytime. 
and you can get uh, supreme results from that. Okay, so supreme field of merit, uh, perfect guru, I guess you could say, through the power of having made offerings and respectful requests. So this means that in the earlier part of the Guru Puja, one has made the seven limb puja, including prostrations and all these other elements. You've made uh, other, uh, all different kinds of offerings, outer, inner, secret, suchness offerings and so forth. And you've made supplications or requests to, to uh, receive blessings from them. I seek your blessings uh, savior and the very root of happiness and goodness that I may come under your joyful guidance. So uh, Mutra Dharma Bhadra uh, is saying that when we talk about happiness and goodness, happiness here means uh, sort of temporary happiness, maybe, maybe even the uh, happiness of uh, higher rebirths and so forth, or the happiness that we find now. And uh, legpa, de, de, dewa means happiness, legpa means goodness. Uh, goodness refers to ultimate goodness, uh, what we might say, um, you know, liberation and enlightenment, sort of the ultimate or future goodness. Temporary happiness and ultimate, you know, the, the, the root of all temporary happiness and uh, ultimate goodness of, you know, making these high realizations. Uh, as a result of that, I, I request you to, to grant blessings to be cared for by you. Here it says, under your joyful guidance, cared for by you. Uh, gladly, happily, or uh, joyfully, that is willingly, that the guru will guide you due to your uh, having, re, you know, practiced the proper guru devotion uh, in, in bestowing uh, teachings about the tantra, the sutra and tantra, along with their oral instructions, pith instructions. So dugyu mengak dan cheba, geshen du sowe jesu zimpa jingilo. So when you recite this verse, you can remember all of the elements of guru devotion that you may have studied at other times. That is to say, um, there are two, uh, two ways to, to rely on the guru to say practice guru devotion uh, in thought and in action. So in thought is to basically means to remember uh, the guru's kindness and to, um, to develop, you know, some, uh, some respect and so forth and re to remember their qualities in action means the things that you do in the presence of the guru. When the guru comes in the room, you, you stand, you, you are, are respectful, you try to follow their advice. Um, the, the, the most important way of relying on the guru is putting their instructions into practice. That means offering practice to the guru. Uh, Jason Milarepa, the great saint of Tibet who achieved enlightenment in one lifetime, he said, although he didn't have many things to offer to, the, to Marpa, his guru, uh, he offered him his practice. So one of the verses that will come, come uh, in the Lama Chopa, when you are making offerings, not in this glance meditation, but earlier in the puja, is the offering of practice, imagining your own uh, practice, you know, the 
uh, your exertion and keeping vows and keep doing the succession yoga every day and uh, meditating and so forth. Uh, imagine them in the form of flowers and lotuses on the banks of a of a uh, of a of a sea in, a, in an island that is covered with uh, different kinds of beautiful plants, which are emanations of your own virtues that you've collected through the practice, and even the virtues of others you offer, you know, Lama Zopa's virtues, and, you know, the Dalai Lama's virtues, and, uh, you know, so forth and so on. So when you, when you do this verse, you can go through the stages of the path teachings that you may have received on guru devotion. And maybe the first time, the first, if you do this every day, this glance meditation, it's kind of a panorama of the whole path. Um, you may spend more time on this verse for a couple of days. And once you know, you've, you may meditate on this verse on guru devotion, maybe you have your texts open in front of you and you use it as a study session. And uh, you go through all of those stages of guru devotion. And at the end of that first verse, imagine from the holy body of the, the guru and all of the bodies of the merit field, uh, light and nectar comes, five colored lights and nectars come and uh, embed themselves within you and all other beings that you're imagining around you, eliminating your obscurations and bringing uh, blessings to make the realization of guru devotion. This is, this is the same thing that happens with each of these verses. You can imagine there are various uh, teachings on how to do that. Sometimes you say the first time a white light comes purifying you of obscurations, obstacles that prevent you from actualizing the teaching, you know, ah, the guru, who needs the guru, you know, thoughts like this, helping to purify that. And then uh, golden light coming, white light coming to purify, golden light coming to bring blessings of realizations to actually realize those, those thoughts. So that's more or less what he says about the first verse. So because we have these short classes, hour and a half, uh, and we're limited in, in time, although the, the subject of proper reliance on the guru, which we can call guru devotion, is a very important and vast one because that, that proper reliance is said to be uh, the root of the path it's like the, the root of a tree without, without proper maintenance of the root with, uh, roots without, uh, you know, if you were to chop up those roots, if you were not to have roots, you'd never get the, uh, the tree to grow. And in the same way, uh, the realizations of the path depend on proper reliance on the guru. This is, this is uh, one of the main teachings of the, of the Lan Rim on Guru Devotion. So just to mention a couple of things to remind you what you might do. You, you know, if you if you look at the uh, commentary on the Lan Rim on Guru Devotion, there are many many sections. The advantages of depending on a spiritual guide, relying properly relying on them, proper behavior and so forth, and the disadvantages of not having a guru or improperly relying on them. You know, disparaging them and so forth creating negative karma. Main advantage is that uh, just as if we were to go to on a, on, a, on a trip to Egypt or in a safari somewhere, we might very well hire a guide if we were going to a place that we'd never been before, especially if it was dangerous, you know, Africa. Or, uh, even if you go to Italy, you sometimes hire a guide to take you through the Sistine Chapel or uh, something like that, or 
You may take the bus first time you go to New York, you may take the, the tour bus around the city, someone to guide you around. So uh, the path to enlightenment is one that we've never completed before. We may have dabbled in it in some previous lifetimes, but we've never uh, gotten to the point of irreversibility in the path. Uh, I can't speak for all of you in my case. Uh, so we need a guide, even in the, in the world, we, for day, going to a new place that is perhaps dangerous if, you, if it's not approached correctly, because if you're trying to uh, go to, an, to uh, the stage of enlightenment with a wrong teacher, uh, someone who has, you know, impure motivations and so forth, it can destroy you both now and all your chances for the future. So it's very important to find a proper spiritual guide, one who has the qualities of, uh, because here we're talking about the, uh, the Mahayana in general, someone who has the qualities of a Mahayana teacher. So basically, the minimum is that they should be more concerned about future lives and have compassion. They should be based on compassion. They shouldn't be someone who's only interested in how, to, you know, teaching you how to have a better, happy, happy life this, this lifetime. In more detail, we talk about the 10 qualities of a Mahayana guru, like in the, I think in the, with the Bodhisattva Bhumi, uh, can't remember what it says. Shenyan dua shiva neshapa yundin lakpa sunje lungi chup dini raptu tokla make den sewe dakni kyola pangla ten means uh, one should rely on a, a shenyan, spiritual friend, who is. Uh, dua, who is subdued due to the practice of Vinaya, you know, understanding karma, even if they, they're not a monk or nun, or even have lay vows, there's someone who understands karma, so they're subdued by that realization and that their, their mind is bound uh, by avoiding negative karma. Dua Shiva, Shiva means the mind is pacified, like calmed, due to the achievement of concentration. So that's not, uh, not disturbed by emotions. And nershipa means uh, fully, fully, you know, fully uh, pacified due to the development of wisdom that realizes emptiness. So the, the rely on a guide, a spiritual guide has these 10, these are sort of the 10 qualities. So there are, they are subdued, they are pacified. Uh, they are, uh, I can't remember the English translation of Nershiva, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, brought about, you know, supreme, brought about a supreme peace. Yonder Lakba means the, a guide that has more qualities than you. That doesn't mean that they know Microsoft Word as well as you, uh, you know, uh, or they, means that they have spiritual qualities, yonden, uh, guna, greater than the disciple. You shouldn't rely on teachers uh, who, in general, you have, that are, in, that are uh, lower on the path than you. Uh, yonden, lakpa, sunche, who are energetic, who are rich in uh, spiritual in uh, in scriptural understanding that means they've they've received a great deal of teachings they can like sometimes the lamas when they talk about a subject they can quote from this text or that text off the top of their head they're they're rich in 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 uh, scriptural citations. So what do we have? Subdued, pacified, thoroughly pacified, uh, higher quality than, than the disciple, uh, energetic, uh, 
rich in, in scripture. Deni Tokla, that means uh, uh, they, have, they have a realization of ultimate reality. The, the perfect spiritual guide. Deni Tokla, Make Den, who are skilled in uh, speaking, ex ex giving exposition. Sewe Dakni. Sewe Dakni means who have a compassionate character, compassionate nature, and Sewe uh, Dakni Kyola Panglaten, someone who has given up discouragement and laziness. That's the, the kind of spiritual guide that you, you should rely on. So you can, for instance, you can uh, study teachings about that and uh, first of all, analyze your spiritual guides. And once you develop a confidence that they have at least some of these qualities, uh, how to rely upon them in thought and action. So basically, this is a way for you in, in a very short, short verse to remind you of several of the seminal qualities of that meditation. And when you when you do this glance meditation, maybe the, the first day you do it, you spend, after reciting that verse, you spend a lot of time meditating on those points. And at the end of meditating, uh, imagine the light and nectar coming from the merit field, uh, bringing you blessings to overcome your uh, obstacles to realizing that and, and to bring the uh, blessings of making the realizations. After that, you can recite the other verses to remind you of where you're going yet, right? Every day you do the whole thing. That's why it's called a glance meditation or panoramic meditation. You know, you sort of look where, you know, where, where you've been, where you are, where you're going. Maybe the second day or after some days when you, you have some kind of experience of remembering the, the, the important points of guru devotion, you will go on to spending more time on the second verse. You've said the second verse and the third and the fourth up to the whatever, 37 verses every day, but you put more time every day on one of the verses until you have start to have some experience of that. Then you go on to the next. So let's go on to the next one. Let's go on to the next verse. Um, Sheila, could you put up uh, the second verse? So here it says, taking the essence of the perfect human rebirth. So let's see here. So in, in Mutra Dharma Bhadra's text, it says, uh, this, this section, sort of a general outline is uh, having relied on a guru, how to train the mind. So there are two parts. Um, and one of the parts is, comes near the end of the text. Uh, the way to train the mind in the stages of the paramita vehicle, the paramita yana, you know what that means? The, the bodhisattva's practice or you know, the uh, non-tantric non and the way to train the mind in the uh, Vajrayana path. Okay, so that, that's just, that, that comes later, but the first part, how to train the mind in the, the sutra path is two parts here. Um, generating a mind, an, a, 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 an, an understanding, um, of striving for the purpose of future lives. And the second outline is uh, the, it, 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 that show, the second outline shows the method to uh, Chikten Shime Dewe Top, the method of attaining that uh, happiness in future lives. So the first, the first one is 
uh, generating an awareness that strives for the happiness of, of uh, for the aim of future lives. So what this is meaning is um, this first verse of our text here, uh, realizing how this body of freedom and richness is found but once, is difficult to obtain and is quickly lost. I seek your blessings to make it worthwhile and take its essence without being distracted by the meaning, meaningless affairs of this life. So this verse is um, bringing together two of the, of the Lan Rim meditations, uh, the meditation on perfect human rebirth, the life of leisure and endowment, and the meditation on death and impermanence. In Lama Tsongkhapa's, in Nutra Dharmabhadra's commentary mentions that the method of uh, meditating on these two subjects are unified uh, in the three, princi three principles of the path uh, by Lama Tsongkhapa. So you don't, you, there's, they, they, because they're so intimately related, to, to really recognize uh, what you can do with this lifetime of, of leisure and endowment, it's very important to realize that you won't have it long, that you're going to die, that it's, uh, it's quickly lost. Even in every second, you're getting closer to death and so forth. And so that can intensify your understanding of the of this meditation. So this is essentially two meditations. Uh, if you have commentaries of the Lan Rim, uh, the meditation on perfect human rebirth, which, which means what? Recognizing what the life of leisure and endowment means, recognizing its, uh, its great meaning, the meaning of life. You might say, people say, you know, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life or something like that? So um, when we talk about uh, the perfect human rebirth, the great, its great purpose or meaning is that we can achieve, uh, you know, create the karma to have future lives in the upper realms rather than going to the lower realms sort of minimal, minimal kind of meaning. We can achieve, uh, in a greater sense, we can create the karma to make realizations of renunciation, bodhicitta, realization of emptiness, you know, the wisdom that realizes emptiness. Uh, or we can leave imprints that in future lifetimes, we make those realizations more quickly. Uh, and a higher sense, uh, the great meaning of having a life of leisure and endowment like this is that we can uh, possibly in this lifetime achieve nirvana, you know, the, the, the lesser vehicle nirvana, or in an ultimate sense, we could achieve even enlightenment this lifetime. You may have, you may have, may have had a sequence of lives where you're high bodhisattva and you can culminate that this lifetime, or through the practice of tantra, even if you haven't realized renunciation, bodhicitta, or the wisdom realizing emptiness, you can, through the practice of Tantra, uh, in as short a time as three years, maybe even less sometimes, you can accumulate all of the, the, the knowledge and uh, merits to achieve that enlightenment in one lifetime, one short lifetime in this degenerate age. So that there are various great meanings or purpose of uh, purposes that you could say um, of having a life of leisure and endowment. So what does it mean, leisure and endowment? Leisure mean, or freedom means that you're not burdened with the unfree states of say being born in the hell realm as an animal, as a hungry ghost. You, sometimes these two you can say the heaviest from that suffering point of view, uh, hell realm is more suffering, right? 
uh, but from the point of view, and so usually Preta realm, hungry ghost is more suffering than the animals, but uh, in a certain sense of realization, the animals are in a worse condition because they have more ignorance. Some Pretas can actually uh, receive teachings and, and develop some realizations. So those are unfree states. Uh, unfree states also of being born as a long life God uh, in the desire realm, in the form and formalist realms, one's life may be spent in uh, just using up one's good karma. That maybe was most people do anyway. Uh, you know, that has, you know, that if you're a uh, trust fund, <laughs> trust fund gal or guy, uh, long, life, long life gods may spend their, a certain, certain one uh, may spend their entire life in a mindless state, uh, just experience, experiencing a neutral state of mind, utilize, using up their virtuous karma and giving rise to perhaps in the very next lifetime being born in hell. So it's really, there's no chance of practicing the path and on a certain, certain kind of long life gods. Uh, being born in a country where there is, uh, the Buddhas uh, have not descended to the world, where there's no, there's no Buddha Dharma. Being born in, in a, uh, a barbarian land, like certain places where you are uh, prevented from practicing religion. Uh, Jennifer, is it, are you from China? No, where are you from? Queens, New York. But, <laughs> oh, yeah, but okay, but I meant your your family. Korean. 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 Okay, so Korea is certainly not a barbarian land because there are Korean Buddhists that can practice and so forth. If you were born in communist China right now, that might be a kind of like a barbarian, uh, barbarian land. North Korea. Oh, North Korea. There, there we go. North Korea. Ah, okay. You're, okay, I my, won't ask. My you. dad was from North Korea. He escaped okay. right before the war. But. Yeah. So that's that's kind of like uh, maybe being, being born without a perfect human rebirth at one time, but then during that lifetime, creating the causes to to fill in the rest of the the elements of a life of leisure and endowment. So leisure means being free from the eight unfree states. So you could read in the in the long room literature. Endowment means uh, having other factors from your own side and from the outside world present that are contributing factors to, to practicing the Dharma. Being born as a human being in the middle of a religious country with perfect organs, uh, you know, not being uh, blind or mute, uh, although one can overcome that, like Helen Keller, but generally. Uh, in earlier times, uh, the, they became great obstacles to practicing. In, in certain times, uh, you were not allowed to take ordination if you had certain uh, features like that that would prevent you from, from uh, practicing properly. Um, from the side of your, your own side, you have faith in the, in, uh, the existence of the... the spiritual path, and you have the existence of compassionate people, uh, benefactors and so forth. The Buddha has descended into the world, turned the wheel of Dharma, that those Dharma teachings have not completely disappeared from the world and so forth. So that's called recognizing the perfect human rebirth. And then recognizing because of having those conditions, a life of leisure and endowment, you are actually free to practice the Dharma every single second. It's not as though uh, uh, there are any obstacles. If you have a life of leisure and endowment, it doesn't mean you have to have a million dollars or a, a condo or uh, so many other things first before you practice the Dharma. So, um, let's see here. Lenchik, Lenchik Samshik Nepe Deljordi. 
So this del jor, del means leisure and jor means richness. This leisure and endowment that we have, that we have found just this one time, lenchik means one time, some means only, merely. So it, what it's, it's reminding you of the rarity of the perfect human rebirth, a life of leisure and endowment uh, in terms, main, main thing here is talking about uh, the rarity in terms of the causes. Most people find it very difficult to create the causes of a future life of leisure and endowment. Do you know what the causes of, of a life of leisure and endowment are? Anyone? I'm sure some of you do. I'm, I'm sure some of them, yeah. Uh, Philip, do you know? No. So, George, do you know? In, okay, I wasn't sure you were going to unmute. So, generally, we say the main causes of leisure and endowment is the uh, having created the karma in previous lives of pure morality. That's the general uh, cause to be born in the upper realms. But then to have the other kinds of things that you need, uh, food and resources and so forth, to have made uh, practice charity in previous lifetimes. And generally in the Lan Rim, it's, it, it gives those two preference. So the first two of the six paramitas, generosity and morality, in previous lifetimes, and then to, to uh, through the application of pure prayer or wishes, uh, sort of ripening those karmic seeds to bring about a life of leisure endowment. Generally, we say though, in a more extensive way, the practice of the six paramitas, the six perfections in previous lifetime. One way to, to, even without practicing them very thoroughly, one way to create the cause of having a perfect human rebirth in the future is to take the 24 hour Mahayana vows. Do you ever do that at your center? The Tet Chen Sojung. Like when, when, if you go to Dharamsala, when the Dalai Lama teaches, uh, if it comes on full moon or new moon, uh, they often take the 24 hour vows. So sort of like monk or nun for a day. Right? So you, <clears throat> you avoid killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. So you don't have any sexual contact that day. Uh, you don't eat uh, after uh, midday and so forth. Sit on high thrones where you could develop pride. There's certain vows that you take. If you take those vows for 24 hours with the intention of creating the karma to eventually achieve enlightenment with a Mahayana motivation, you can create in that one day the cause to achieve a perfect human rebirth again in the future. It won't necessarily be the next life. Maybe if you do it many times, you'll have many seeds that can ripen at the time of death and you're gonna have a perfect human rebirth, even if you don't do a lot of other practice. So generally in the, in the Buddhist countries, in Thailand and other countries, they take the, um, they don't take the Mahayana uh, 24 hour vows. They take the which general uh, 24 hour vows. It's sort of like being, you know, in the Theravada sense of, of uh, renunci taking those vows with the, uh, with the motivation of renunciation from cyclic existence. So, Lenchik Samchik Nepe Derjodi, this life of leisure and endowment, which has been found just this one time because we haven't created the causes for it in the future, uh, in the past. And like the, the proverbial tur uh, tur turtle that lives on the bottom of the ocean, I say proverbial because uh, Nargajuna gave a verse about this and there, I think in the sutras you find a, a turtle lives on the bottom of the ocean uh, for a hundred years, comes up once every hundred years for a gulp of air and sticks its head above the surface of the ocean, takes a gulp. 
that's kind of like the frequency within which uh, you take rebirth in the upper realms. So anyone know how many seconds there are in a year? I can't remember. I think it was, it was some three George, times you know? 10 to the seventh, George. Huh? Three times 10 to the seventh. Yeah, it's, it's a pi times 10 to the seventh, they say. So, uh, sort of, we say napkin physics people know those kind of things. So if they're uh, that many seconds in a year, one second, one out of, you know, three times 10 to the seventh times, uh, you'll have a rebirth in the upper realms left to ordinary circumstances, circumstances just some karma that you have from way, way in the past ripening. If you wanted to have a succession of rebirths, you have to do something about it. You have to create some some of uh, these causes, pure morality and generosity and pure prayers, you know, especially bodhicitta Buddha, Buddha motivation. So this is found, this, this life of the leisure endowment is found just this one time. Uh, Neka it is difficult to find again. So this is recognizing the rarity of the perfect human rebirth so that uh, you realize that you have a very rare opportunity. I used to think of the example uh, once in Manjushri Institute, uh, which was an FPMT center at that time in, in uh, Cumbria in Northern England, the Lake District. Uh, we got uh, a deal from Xerox to have a, a duplicating machine for one day or, or for a weekend or something like that, you know, to test it out to see if we wanted to buy it. So they, that's sort of an enticement. And so everyone in the Institute was down there continually over the weekend, one book after another, you know, making photocopies. Uh, you know, you didn't want to waste that opportunity because it was very rare that you would have that opportunity to make free copies. All you had to do was pay for the paper. I think they were paying for the, the toner or whatever it's called, the ink within the, the machine. Another example is if you were to have uh, plates to print money that you only had, you know, you only had it for a certain amount of time. This is like the, the length of a lifetime. You have this perfect human rebirth for just, you know, uh, how many years, you know, 65, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, at the 100 and, 110, 120, what's the oldest person in the world these days, 120, that's the, the limit, you know. So if you had the, the, the plates to make $100 bills for that time, every day you would be churning out the dollars because you knew how, what great value that was. Um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche used to say in Lan Rim courses, if you knew where you were be, where you would be born, where you will be born or would be born in the next life, you wouldn't sleep at night. Meaning, if you could see, if, or if you if you were told by a Lama who had clairvoyance, a person who had clairvoyance, you're going to be born as a a dog or a preta or a crow or a, in the hell realms in the next lifetime, you wouldn't sleep at night. You'd be up all the time taking advantage of this life of leisure and endowment to, to, op to maybe to purify that negative karma that would imp throw you to the lower realms because it's, it's a very rare situation. Lenchik samshik devo nerdhati, this life of this leisure and endowment that we have found just one time is difficult to find Difficult, difficult to obtain means again, because it needs pure morality, um, genera you know, and the practice of generosity and so forth, prayer, other contributing factors, virtuous factors, very difficult to practice. Nirdu jikpe sultokne, having realized the way in which this situation uh, quickly decays. Nirdu means quickly. Chikpa means decay. So that means every second you're getting closer to death. Right? It's like the, the person who is 
being led to the scaffolds where they're going to be hung. You know, people are, you've seen sometimes convicts that are being taken to the electric chair, or you hear about them fighting with the guards because they know every step they take, they're getting closer to death. There's some, some stories I've probably told many times, so you have to excuse me if you hear these stories again. There, there was a, an Italian uh, TV ad for Italian telecom that I would see sometime when I went into the kitchen at Istituto Lama Socapa, where I lived for many years in Italy, and the, the monks would be watching the soccer game, you know, foot, football, right? Excuse me, football. And there was one ad that I loved because it was this guy, he was, it was before the foreign legion, the guys all had their rifles ready to execute him. And, uh, you know, he was trying to find some reason uh, to, to delay that, you know, and he's talking, he had asked the guy to let him talk to his mama on the phone, the cell phone, the Italian telecom. And he said, mama, without this phone, I'd be dead. Okay, that's this is my joke. Because <laughs> with it was only because of the phone he was able to ask for one last, you know, like one last cigarette before you shoot and so forth. So having realized the way in which this life, this life of leisure endowment that I found once is it, it, so rare to find. It has great value and that it quickly decays with every second. Like the, uh, like if you have a, a stash of uh, what, coffee, you know, you have a big can of coffee, you think, oh man, this will last me for a long time. Every time you take a scoop out, you know, you don't notice until a couple, a couple of weeks later, you put your, your spoon in and you have to go down further. And, Finally, you're at the bottom. Every time, every second, you're getting closer to death. Uh, every time uh, you use these things, they're being consumed and so forth. So, re so having realized the way in which this life of leisure endowment not only is highly mean of, meaningful, difficult to obtain, again, uh, but it also quickly decays don't may sedi jawe mi yangwar without being distracted by the meaningless activities of this life. Don den ningpo lempa jingilo, grant me blessings to take the uh, highly meaningful essence. So this is this encompasses some of the the, the essential points of the medit both the meditation on death and impermanence and perfect human rebirth. So what this is meaning, don't may sedi jawe mi anwar, without being distracted by the meaningless activities of this lifetime. Here, meaningless activities means the usual things we work, we want, we worry about. You know, the appearance of this lifetime, the appearance, you know, actually from the point of view of emptiness, all of these things that we think of as so important and real and compelling are totally devoid of that importance that we put them, we, we, that we attribute to them. They don't even exist at all the way that they appear. So any activity uh, that is centered on taking these appearances of this lifetime as real are called meaningless activities. Here the text says, uh, generating the awareness that strives for future aims is synonymous with uh, reversing, let's see, reversing from the craving for mere incidental pleasure or the, you know, the superficial uh, happiness of this lifetime. So 
meaningless activities. There's a famous verse in, in the book that Lama Sopa composed many years ago called the, uh, the, the Golden Sun of the Mahayana Mind Training, something like that. It was a, his Lam Rim text that we used at Kopan. I don't know if it was ever published, but he quoted one of the, uh, the Karmapas. Might have been the first Karmapa, or I can't remember. Anyway, the verse was, at the time of death, the vision of this life is like last night's dream. All meaningless actions are like ripples on a lake. I was getting to the meaningless actions. So at the time of death, unlike, uh, you know, I don't know what the popular culture talking about going to the white tunnel or something like that, or the, all of these different things. Uh, the, the, the vision of this life is like last night's dream. In other words, when I woke up this morning, I had a, I was, I was just waking up from a dream, and it, it at the moment before I woke up, it seemed so real, right? The moment I woke up, I go, ah, oh, that was just a dream. I can't remember what it was, what was happening last night. Now I've even forgotten it already. Uh, so meaningless activities is what we spend most of our life on. Meaningless activities of uh, accumulating wealth, well, essentially practicing the eight worldly concerns, the eight worldly dharmas, you know, craving for pleasure of the senses, uh, possessions, fame, and uh, love, and so forth, craving to be free of, of being, uh, of suffering, uh, you know, not, not, not willing to put up with even a little bit of suffering, uh, wanting to avoid losing anything, uh, wanting to avoid uh, being criticized or unloved and so forth. The eight worldly concerns. You can see other definitions of them. Usually it's, the lamas say that the most difficult of those to give up for a Dharma practitioner is... Uh, What do you think it is? Do you know? Anyone? I would say good reputation. Yeah, it, but not general reputation, but to be, to hear sweet, ego pleasing words and sounds, the way that Lama Sopo had said, uh, that means that at least somewhere, is it Lama used to say, even for hippies, they gave up possessions and uh, wealth and so forth. They still, within their small group of hippies, they still wanted to be considered well or loved or liked. Not necessarily fame, but yeah, maybe you could call it the, the, the lesser kind of the, the last two. So without being distracted by the meaningless activities of this lifetime, please grant me blessings to take the essence, the meaningful essence, so this brings to mind the, the verse of Atisha that said something like this, that uh, the objects of knowledge, the things that can be known are infinite, uh, but life is very short. Therefore, be like the stork, be like the, um, I'm not sure what the bird, stork, uh, that can take a, a bill full of pond water within which someone has poured milk and let all of the water come out the holes at the bottom of its beak and just take the essence. So you have to be able to take the essence of this lifetime. What's the essence of a life of leisure endowment? Is to, is to engage in meaningful activities that will have a lasting impact on uh, your continuum in a beneficial way, creating virtuous karma, making realizations, uh, generating good heart, you know, being calm and so forth. So we've reached our 8.30 time. So what I'd like to do is just make a quick dedication and then I'll remain for a couple more minutes if anyone has some things they wanna discuss. Uh, I'm not sure. Is that allowable?
is, is it is this zoom thing finished at exactly 8 30. no we can um, keep going for a little bit okay. okay so some of you may have made other plans maybe you're going to watch uh the law and order special victim units crossover tonight where Elliot Stabler comes back after 10 years. So that comes out at nine, so you still have time. Okay, so let's, uh, maybe you wanna have dinner before you see that. So let's first dedicate. We try to create a, a motivation at the beginning that we were listening and participating tonight, not simply uh, to accumulate knowledge, to show off at a cocktail party or something, or to, you know, you know oh, look at me, I'm meditating but to create the causes to have uh, spiritual realizations now and in the future. Think whatever merit I've created tonight, may that, that not ripen simply in some samsaric happiness in the future, some, you know, that I, that I become attached to and so forth, but in whatever way it ripens, it will definitely ripen as something uh, experienced as happy, you know, uh, whatever way it ripens, may it become the cause of my continued spiritual realization year by year, life by life, up to and including the achievement of enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings so that I can spontaneously and effortlessly lead them out of suffering into that same state. This is what's called dedication. So no, we'll, we'll do some prayers and other, other times, but uh, with that, it's, it's 8.32 or three, uh, those of you who have other things that you've committed to, uh, feel free to leave. If anyone has any questions or things they want to discuss, raise your hand or send out some message to Sheila, those people whose pictures. Are, okay, so CYD Tran has a question. You have to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Oh, turn up your volume. Still can't hear you. I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. Okay. Is it Sid? Is that your CYD is your first name? Uh, Cindy. It's Cindy. Oh, Cindy. Okay. Cindy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great night. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, you have a question? No? You, you're just giving thumbs up, okay. Who has a question? Or something they want to discuss or clarify or dispute? Did I make some mistake? Uh, Tal. Yeah, you mentioned, um, thank you for the teaching, it was wonderful. Um, you mentioned a book, Manjushri's Innermost Secret. Yes, um, I've got it here. It's a bit so, lovely, <laughs> It's, it, it is another commentary on Lama Chopa. You can get commentaries like the Dalai Lama's commentary that was translated by Tukhtin Jimpa from an oral teaching. Uh, there are other commentaries that you can find, but this is one of the great Lamas of the past, uh, Kanchen Yeshe Geltsin, one of the great uh, super erudite Lamas of the past. And this was this commentary is was written from the beginning. It wasn't like transcribed from an oral teaching, so they were able to make it very precise. So this is a general commentary on Lama Chopa. Can you read it? Okay. Yes. So, so I, I, had, I had read somewhere that we need it's best to have some sort of empowerment to read that particular text. Is that not the case? Well, this is a commentary. This is a commentary of Lama Chopa, and when His Holiness uh, and other lamas have given commentaries on Lama Chopa, uh, there are various um, interpretations. Sometimes it's given to anyone. Sometimes it's given only to people who have received 
a highest yoga empowerment. But because I'm only teaching the glance meditation at the beginning, I'm not talking about offering of soak and, um, you know, inner secret suchness offerings and so forth. Uh, this talk that we're having right now uh, doesn't have any restriction like that. I'm just talking about a general way. So, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So anyone else have something they'd like to ask? George? Yeah, I actually do have a comment that it, thank you so much for the teaching, Venerable George. <laughs> That is actually very similar to the source of all my good, but I'm in his Sankhapa in his beginning in the verses. Am yes. I correct to think that way? Yes, yes. That's, so I had mentioned at the beginning, I'd asked uh, the foundation of all good qualities. So you, you've, you've, you've called it the source of good, which is essentially another way of translating it. Yondin Shir Gyoma uh, is sort of like some of the words of the first line of that text. So that also is a glance meditation on the Lanrim that Lama Tsongkhapa wrote. And that often is recited. So you can see many similarities. In fact, sometimes it's fun to alternate one day do this glance meditation, one day do that, because they, they have slightly different uh, takes on the essential points. And they can bring to mind uh, your, you know, some other kinds of realizations. So, you, but you're absolutely right. That is a, this is a similar kind of thing that Yondin Shirgyama or the source of good or the foundation of good qualities, however it's translated, is a glance meditation, a panoramic meditation. So the sense of that, the, the idea of that is, as I said before, every day to keep in mind the whole path. I, sometimes when I do at night, Generally, I finish the night with this. Um, maybe my mind is bummed out because of, uh, you know, some terrible thing that's happened to, you know, people in the world, the, the political things, you know, this last couple of years and the COVID, what do they say, the year of the lemon, uh, you know, your mind, you may be going to bed with a negative mind. Meditating on this I'm fine, you know, put everything in perspective as you go through the whole path. So yeah, that's that's a good thing to do also. Someone else want to? Venerable George, I have a question. Uh, yeah, who's Cynthia. speaking? I don't see. Oh, Cynthia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for the teachings. I just want to clarify uh, the, when we say uh, aspiring for higher rebirth, you mean specifically just human rebirth, right? Because the higher uh, realms is not what we're aspiring for, but specifically human rebirth, because that's where we could have the uh, choice to to do virtuous actions and things like that, and bodhicitta and all that. Is that right? Right. In general, that's right. But as you as you may know, in the Theravada. Uh, the Pali Canon, the sutras, uh, many of the benefactors of the Buddha, uh, they, one of their aims was to create the, the karma, to be born in the God realms, to be king of the gods and so forth. Um, and that was considered okay. But in terms of when we talk about uh, to take the essence of this perfect, of this life of leisure and endowment, the sense is, it, it, you know, the meaningful essence, the great meaning is that we can uh, create, well, we, 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 in general, we want to be born as a human. That's the best place to be able to practice. It is possible to practice with deep imprints in your mind, to practice in uh, the desire, in, in some of the desire realm, God realms, uh, but generally the human rebirth is considered to be the best one to easy access to the teachings um, and all of the other leisures and so forth. But you're right, in, in general, what we want to create is the, uh, 
rebirth as a human in the future, human rebirth. Thank you. Yeah. So, Andrup, you have a question? No, okay, I thought you were. Comment, anyone? Ah, Diana. Thank you so much. Thank you for these teachings. Um, I do believe that if I attend Dharma kindergarten for many of my lifetimes, uh, eventually it will really take. <laughs> um, this is a question about how one speaks to somebody who has a strong aspiration to be kind and generous but does not practice the Dharma as such. And it's specifically about how to communicate something like Vajra pride um, as opposed to the pridefulness that is, you know, ego developing and harmful. Mm -hmm. And so I know people who are, some people who come to me for advice, who are so eager to not be what they call that guy, <laughs> that I think it impairs the innate sense we all have, and I do feel this is innate, of a kind of pleasure when you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Is that answerable in that form, or do you need me to reshape it sometime? Um, I'll, I'll just approach it from one or two points. Thank you. Uh, and then maybe we can, you can email me and ask more detail about the specifics that you're talking about. So first of all, even if they don't practice, quote, the Dharma, that we're talking about Buddha Dharma, they may practice, uh, you know, Christian Dharma or Jewish Dharma or Muslim Dharma or Hindu Dharma or something. Generally, uh, the Dharma is said that which holds you up from uh, suffering. So all of those other, other religions, religions of the book and, and other religions, generally they have some good aspects that they teach uh, if, if, if one were to be uh, 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 try to practice them, uh, qualities to enhance one's uh, ethics, one's morality, to abstain from, you know, killing others or sleeping with one's, coveting one's neighbor's wife or whatever, one neighbor's husband or whatever. Uh, but oftentimes people don't, don't have much faith in those dharmas. What I, what I like to think of as something that uh, might be helpful is just to recognize the potential of the mind by simply doing some calming meditation maybe watching the breathing for some days, and then looking at the, the clear light nature of the mind, trying to get an understanding that all of these thoughts that are within the mind are not the very nature of our mind. They can be, even if they come up strongly in certain circumstances and we can't control ourselves. I've never myself ever done what you see on TV programs where people get angry, they take something out of the desk and they throw it all away and they bang on the wall. I don't know where that comes from. Some people don't have any, any, any control. I've, I've certainly uh, said bad words when things have uh, you know, turned out bad, but I've never th thrown things around. But if, if one recognizes uh, through meditation, calming the mind, that the thoughts are not always present. They're adventitious, adventitious uh, especially the negative thoughts. They come about because of causes and conditions. And one can realize that you can let go of those and go back into that calm state uh, that sometimes can give some help. Now, I'm not gonna say any more now but why don't you, if it was some particulars, because I know you have always liked to have a detailed explanation. Let's end here. 
I think we've got I'll 15 ask you more another time. Yeah. I'll ask you more another time. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, hope to see you next time. Maybe, uh, maybe try reciting these verses and uh, during the sometime during the week. And uh, so you have a little bit of experience when we talk next time. Take care. Thank you, Venerable George. Thank you all. See you all next time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you.